We, we are so disconnected. We, we, we need to get reconnected in ordinary human ways. And if it didn't happen in your home the way you wanted to when you're growing up, well, you know, wherever we are, now's the time to start. And so in college can't be just about the academics. The academics are key. Hey, I'm a professor. That's what I do. And I'm, I'm, I'm all about it. But we need, we need to be taking a hard look at how we are living, what are our lifestyle, what are our moral choices, how are we spending time with our friends? What, what does that whole lifestyle look like? Join the best in the movement. It's conservative conversations with ISI, educating for liberty since 1953. Welcome back. You're listening to Conservative Conversations with Tom Saroof. No Marlo today. But I'm joined by John Cutterback, who is a longtime professor in the philosophy department at Christendom College for over 25 years. And he also blogs at Lifecraft and has a book on true friendship. So, John, we're going to be talking about, I think, friendship today and Lifecraft and marriage and manhood. So very excited to be joining you or having you join us for this conversation. Welcome. Thanks, Tom. Great to be with you. And I you know, mentioned a couple things about your bio, but to start, it'd be great to have you Tell us a little bit more about yourself and your interests, where you come from. Super, super. Well, um, you know, I, uh, I consider myself to be a kind of philosopher farmer uh, or philosopher homesteader. Um, I have, as you mentioned, been uh, had the blessing to be a philosophy professor for many years. And uh, that certainly is a great love of my life. Um, but you know, more fundamentally, I am married, blessed with six children. Now I have five grandchildren. Um, four of the six children were born in the house uh, that we live in, where we have lived for the vast majority of our marriage. And uh, we hope that it's our forever home. It's, uh, it's, it's a homestead in the, in the full sense. We've raised many animals and grown many things. And uh, I've always found that kind of living close to the earth has been a very great accompaniment uh, and complement of pursuing wisdom and being a teacher. So that kind of all blends together then into this other project I do at Lifecraft, where I'm trying to kind of bring the ancient wisdom, the timeless wisdom, apply it to our time. Uh, because, hey, as a philosophy professor, you learn that ideas have consequences, as someone you know once said. That's right. And, um, you know, it, it's these truths change lives. They should change lives. And so I thought, wow, you know, seeing what's happening in the classroom, I'd like to bring this to a wider audience. I'd like to try to do everything that I can, especially to bring a kind of down home common sense wisdom about the good life, about the good life, especially in the kind of primordial aspects of that, in the relationships in our life that are most important, in the kind of daily work, and of course, home, family being that primordial natural community, that has always been a particular focus, as has friendship, because, well, of course, as Aristotle says, life is lived in friendship. Mm. So that's, uh, that's, that's kind of a little bit what makes me tick. Hey there, listener. I wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations. This podcast is a production of the Intercollegiate Studies Institute, and our mission here at ISI is Educating for Liberty. If you'd like to join us in fulfilling our mission, consider helping us by rating and reviewing this podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you listen to help us reach more listeners like yourself. Now, back to the show. Awesome. And that's plenty of things that we'll certainly dive into. I'm curious to start, how did you get into philosophy or when did that become sort of the, when did the life of the mind become uh, a pursuit that you said, this has to be what I dedicate my life to, at least in an intellectual or professional way? Yeah, well, I have to say I was, I was very, very blessed in my undergraduate education, which actually was also at Christendom to have great philosophy professors. And it just so opened my eyes. So just kind of gave me this new view of reality. Um, I mean, in, in, in a sense, I never turned back. And then, you know, to have the opportunity to go and study in graduate school and, and think, wow, I, I actually could make a living, uh, a decent living uh, as, a, as a professor in, uh, to, to just keep pursuing these things and helping others understand them. It's, it's just, I, I, I can't imagine at this point doing anything else. That resonates with me. I was an undergrad at Boston College and 
I've said many things on this podcast about Boston College, but one of the things I um, always praise BC for is the philosophy department. And my first intro to philosophy class, the professor took the life of the mind and took the history of ideas so seriously and imparted that that sort of same love and you know just it's an endless exploration um, amen and i want to ask advice i think a lot of our students will are potentially thinking about graduate school or interested in these sorts of ideas i'm sure we'll be talking a lot about advice uh, on this episode but what advice do you have for undergraduate students or maybe graduate students as they're discerning um, whether or not a professorship or trying to go into the academy is a good fit for them, whether it's a worthwhile pursuit of their time and effort or whether they might be better off doing something else? Well, wow, Tom, that's a hard question. It, you know, I mean, I actually, I have kind of a, a shtick that I'm almost sorry to say that I have, but I think it's just, hey, we have to remind ourselves, we have to live in the world in which we are. You, you, you don't want to you know, candy coat anything. We have to be realistic. And one of the unfortunate things is the difficulty of getting a job in the academy. And so when someone comes to me and says, hey, I'm loving these philosophy courses. I want to go to graduate school. I, my first approach is to say, well, I am super glad to hear that. This definitely means that philosophy, the pursuit of wisdom more broadly is going to have a very important place in your life. But now let's let's take a careful look in discerning, you know, grad school. Grad school is a very specific thing. It's very different than undergrad. I want everybody, I mean, I really push, get that liberal formation at the undergrad level. That's, I, you know, I have an argument that that's especially today so needed more than ever before to get a liberal formation. But you know, grad school, now, now we're in kind of more job training and because you're doing this because you're going to go into a particular profession. And so I do there ask them to be realistic. Um, you really do have to kind of be the cream of the crop. Mm. You're going to have to be really devoted to this. And you got to be willing to, to say, hey, I'm going to go someplace where I might not have the best job that I would have wanted. I'm going to have to be able to go wherever that job is offered because you don't have many choices. And so that's just that's, I think that's really important for people who maybe a little bit idealistically and understandably. I'm, I'm sad in a sense to have to say that, but I do think that that's the reality. That makes sense. That and also tracks with a fair bit of the advice I've heard from other professors these days. It's just there's not that many jobs out there. Um, and yeah, it's a sort of dog eat dog world. But you said something that I, maybe we could pick up is everyone should go and be liberally educated today. Um, that's, I mean, I certainly agree with that in the sense that, you know, liberal education as um, the process of education and um, disciplining your own soul, disciplining your appetites, integrating your reason with your will um, and, and your soul. That's something that is the project for every person. Um, and certainly in the United States where we have self-government, that's all predicated on cultivating the sort of virtues and the dispositions and habits and opinions that make that possible. Um, how does that happen? Because at least in my experience where I sit from being at ISI, that is not happening um, at way too many places. And so I think the call for liberal education is certainly needed because it's something that is lacking, even as more people are going to colleges, um, presumably to get a liberal arts degree if, or if, you know, if they're not going for a, some sort of explicitly professional degree. But how do we get there or um, what, do, what would that look like in the current landscape? Yeah, I, again, you know, Tom, great question and, and a hard one. Um, you know, the whole, there's a couple of ways we could go with that. The whole model of just kind of the four year college undergrad and the way that's getting so expensive, right? This, this is, this is a real issue. Can we, you know, we can circle back to that. Let me start at kind of 20,000 feet and make a point I think is really super important. We live in an age of bad custom. And so I'm going to put this in kind of Aristotelian terms. Earlier on, it, it, you know, <laughs> No society is perfect, but we can learn a lot from the past. You know, the whole process of a liberal education was very much honed, you know, starting in ancient times th through medieval times and up into modern times. Um, but one feature was it was always generally reserved more to a few people. It was yes. kind of yes. it was not the practice it was going to be for everybody. And, um, you know, it, it, that's worth discussing. But one thing to note is when those who are well formed 
uh, set the tone for a whole society. And then you have, in general, good customs in a society that broadly accepts uh, objective truth and certain principles about reality, then you have a very different situation where you might just say, the common man, I'm going to say, then has less need than he does now for this liberal education because the basic customs of society have been formed by basically right thinking. But then you come to our age where, you know, the, you know, the leaders of our society, the trendsetters um, are in general quite wayward and principles that have become so basic and even to the point that they're even taken as self-evident, as, as Aristotle says, in a society, custom tends to take on this kind of self-evident character. You don't even question these basic assumptions. We have so many bad basic assumptions and so many bad practices that go along with that, that to, it's kind of for a renewal. It's, it's important in a new kind of way for people to be able to go back to the principles. Our leaders in general are not giving us those principles. So we're going to have to study these things. And, and a real passion of mine is then particularly forming people who want to go out and start a home. And, you know, a, a young man, a young woman who want to get married to start a home together, the kinds of principles they're going to need the kind of discernment they're going to have to do, the kind of flexibility they're going to have to have in order to craft a good life in these very contrary circumstances, it goes a very far way to have them have shared principles that they've received by by getting a good, I'll say, you know, liberal formation in the Western tradition. So that, that, that's why I think it's so important. That makes sense. I have another sort of question continuing this sort of thread, because in addition to more people needing a liberal education to sort of fix or undo the bad customs and the bad assumptions that we all inherit, which that's just true of any age or has all sorts of customs, prejudices um, that, you know, this is one of Edmund Burke's is the sort of ideas is the, the French Revolution dissolves the sort of fraternal bonds that people have. Well, that's not a rational thing. That's just people inhabiting the same, the same lived space. And even the the Lord and the serf have this sort of relationship of mutual interdependence. Um, and so this sort of beautiful understanding of prejudice has been destroyed. Um, but now we've like, we haven't gotten rid of prejudice. This is um, right. It's, right. We still have them. They're just now, as you point out, they're, they're bad customs. Um, and so one of the other problems I would say, and I think you're a great person to ask about this since you live off of your land and you have this homestead is the built environment is deteriorating um, in the sense of like the manufacturing has been hollowed out in the United States. But like there's all sorts of um, Chris Buskirk wrote a book that we talked about in the podcast last year about um, restoring national vitality in America. And I really love this book because he's talking about all sorts of when we move from the world that he calls it bolts into bits. Um, it, it, we're altering the emphasis and the attention that we give, but also the actual that, ch that has the consequences for the lived built landscape. Um, and so, you know, we need infrastructure overhaul, all sorts of sort of material things. And so I'm wondering, and I think that at least that that calls for pushing people or suggesting to people that they go into manufacturing and trades and agriculture and agribusiness, things of that sort. It's, um, you know, more ter technical skills as opposed to a liberal arts education. I'm wondering how you, what you think about that and how we, we balance simultaneously the sort of um, the needs of every man and woman to understand their own freedom that is provided by liberal arts education and also um, providing and educating and forming a generation, a working class um, that yeah. has dignity of their work and is also, you know, continuing to build or rebuild um, America right. is a great place in a material sense. Great, 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 great issue, Tom. And I think we got we need people who have the right principles to be asking this question, and it's going to require a new approach to especially higher education, a new approach to the system in any case. And I think you know may, maybe one kind of blessing of what's going on now is uh, certain key features of the traditional, okay, you go off and you get that four-year college education and then maybe go on to grad school. 
I, th- I think that's going to start, it already has in certain ways started to come apart and people are starting to question it. So maybe this is the time to say, okay, you know, let's, let, let's rethink this. Let's r- try to rethink it in terms of the right principles. The right principles are going to require uh, keeping a couple things in tension. And that's what makes for the, the issue you've just raised. The, the importance of liberal formation, okay, maybe not at the higher level for absolutely everybody. I mean, there, there can be a working class that hasn't gone on to higher studies that are liberal. But I mean, then again, I, you know, exactly where do you divide that line? It's, I think it is, again, for the reasons already said, important that at least I mean, maybe it's going on in high school. Right. Maybe maybe they start to get certain things there. They need to be exposed to, to certain key aspects of our history. They need to be exposed to certain kinds of literature and 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 certain principles of thinking. Just just how far? Where are we going to draw those lines? Where are we going to recognize that everybody needs to get this to a certain extent? And then we need to have a kind of a new understanding of the dignity of work in a real working class. Mm. Um, that is one of the huge, there's a whole nother area, Tom, to talk about. Um, you know, one of my, just to throw out a controversial kind of interesting line by a favorite uh, French author of mine from early 20th century, Charles Peggy. A line he said so struck me, in the modern age, we don't allow people to be poor working class. They can't, it, it would make it extremely difficult for them to be working class with dignity. How, how can we rethink things so that there is, you know, so that all of our basic assumptions and in the, in the th- lines of thought that have been coming through our custom don't push all these people. This is the big thing time. You said you want more people to go into, you know, you know, the crafts, the trades, manufacturing. The, the, there's a financial problem with that. Right. How is that going to work? Because at the exact same time, we're saying to our young people, if you want to have a certain uh, standard of living, you need to make this kind of money. And over here, you can't, you know, often make this kind of money. So we have we have this real problem of how we're going to restore um, the dignity of work, how that work is going to fit into our economy. All right. So that's right here. But but I, the only way to do that is we need to be asking these questions and be using basic principles that come through our liberal education and, and, and we're going to have to set up that higher education where there's room for people to be having more trade school kind of formation. And, and, that's, and that's starting to happen. I don't know if you've heard of some of those. They're a little bit of a combination of we're going to give you some liberal formation, but then we're going to be forming you in the trades. I think there's a real future for that. I've heard of you know, the, Saint Col- the uh, College of St. Joseph the Worker where they do yep, sort yep. of theological, philosophical training as well as the trades. There's actually a college pretty close to Wilmington um, where ISI is headquartered that does a similar sort of thing. And they do it three years in trades. And, um, you know, you were mentioning the, I guess, the financial issue of thinking about where you where you stand in the value chain and how that relates to your financial compensation and then all of the sorts of financial goals that everyone seems to have today. Um, and, you know, they all get job placements and apparently make quite a good living us right out of the gate. Because um, actually it, it is true that there's so much demand for manufacturing as things are, breaking down we need people who can actually build things or do things um good point yeah so that's that that is a good point and and that does bring that does bring hope although i i, I mean quick back at you they they can make a decent but but then again there's it's still going to be quite different from where you know many people of the educated class um, are are looking to be financially and i so i think part of that is is readjusting where do we think we need to be financially while having reasonable needs what do we actually need to have in our homestead what do we need to have in our household what standard of living are we demanding and are we going too far in seeking a certain supposed good standard of living and in undermining some of the key values that are act, that are much more important. That maybe sometimes even that greater wealth can undermine. That's a great point. Um, I wonder what you think of this. I mean, I, the the polls that go out say that like forty percent of young people believe in or support socialism over capitalism or think it's better. And I wonder if one of those reasons is simply just 
there's a revolution of rising expectations where um, you know people continue to expect or demand um, or confuse their needs with their desires for more financial um, or economic success, something that is less likely to be attainable or at, at some point it starts to strain credulity as something that's attainable um, just within you know day to day life and so that causes yeah. a certain um, antipathy towards uh, capitalism or free enterprise system. You, you know, Tom, there's a lot, there's a lot going on right there. And so, I mean, he, here's, here's another kind of controversial thing I'd say even, uh, in, especially in conservative circles, how are we, I mean, may paint with broad stroke here, kind of two, two approaches. One is that our, that our, I'll just gonna say our, basically our free enterprise capitalist uh, system is needs a fundamental overhaul it needs it needs different first principles versus it more needs to be revised on its own principles and and we need to fix it because we're not quite doing it right i think that's a very important question because it makes for two different approaches to even then i mean the great question you've you've raised so many young people are disenchanted with let's just kind of say our We'll just say the capitalist system that we have, and you know why is that? That should be telling us something. We do have a problem. What is that problem? How are we going to address it? How radical do we get? I, and I'm just going to come out and say I'm I I I think a little bit more of a radical reevaluation of some first principles rather than kind of tinkering with you know how we're doing it. But that's a whole discussion. So I'm gonna I'm gonna. I'm gonna let you keep. Uh, I'm gonna let you keep driving. Yes, fair enough. I'm sure we we could probably go in that direction. Um, one thing you said a few minutes ago that I just thought brought uh, you know it's reason for hope or something that's encouraging as a trend is this sort of classical school and homeschooling rise where maybe it will be the case in a few years that we won't all need to go to a four year college degree. I was having a conversation mm-hmm. with my mm-hmm. mother a few weeks ago. And we were talking about my future. I, I want to get married and have children. Um, I think that's what I'm called to do. And just sort of talking about my college experience, what I will, knowing what I know now, I don't regret going to Boston College, even though I have problems with the school that I've raised on the, on the show before. Um, but I wouldn't have done it differently for me, but I probably will do it differently for my children. And then I added the caveat, if they even go to college. And she was like, well, what does that mean? Um, and I just was like, well, I don't think we should assume that everyone is supposed to go to a four-year um, college, you know, a degree-seeking institution. They could be off doing something in the trades or they could do like go do a professional skill. Um, and that doesn't mean I don't want my kids to be, edu- an- be educated or I'm anti-education because you're anti-college sure. for all. But it speaks oh, to yeah. the point of what you were raising about how maybe it's done in high school where everyone has this baseline that's met in high school. And so I'm curious, um, seeing the problems that we see in higher education are now trickling down into high school education and even elementary school. And I'm not talking about, um, I don't mean sort of the ideological stuff that's happened incubated in college classrooms is mm-hmm. now being pushed, but more in terms of skills, ability, and ideas that are that are no longer being taught in high schools because it's just sort of assumed that they'll learn that stuff in college. How do we... Uh, yeah. How do we reverse that trend? So yeah. we're teaching the right yeah. things in high school, not just using all of those things as pipelines to four-year colleges and then grad school. All right, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna take that and even expand it out a little bit in a way that I Go know that it. you'll that you'll appreciate. Um, I, I I am a big uh, proponent of taking a, a a new and expanded view of education. Mm. I, I mean, in a sense, this is this is maybe kind of a no-brainer, but actually, I, I think we need to focus on it more in our society. Of I, even in very good homes among very good people, I think the term education is functionally reduced to academics. Right. And, 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 and so I, I think in any case, first of all, implicit in what you were just saying there, I think was very much this, the sense that you already can foresee yourself as being that husband and father who's going to take this kind of principled, richer approach to the formation of my children. And in view of the big picture, I might just say, you know what, this standard kind of academic thing that's been passed on to me might not be what's best for my children. 
and I, 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 I think I think the deep root of that, Tom, is um, that a lot of a, a lot of young people. I'm going to say a lot of people, especially right in your demographic, which I think shows a lot of hope. I, I deal with a lot of of young people getting married who are absolutely. It's it, no no disrespect to their parents. But they have this sense of, wow, I mean, times are really tough now and I'm going to have to do something. Even if what I got was really good, I have to do something. I have to do something different. And they're really looking for, you know, how can we be intentional about what we're doing in our household to form our children? To me, in many ways, this is the issue of the age. And, and I, I, I just want to really get give a big plug and push here for the things that are going on on just the human level of formation, of relationship, of the the development of responsibility, how you interact with people, how you look them in the eye, how you live in the presence of people, how you speak, how you have discussion, real conversation. And, and this is the backdrop for some of the things you're raising there of, you know, that people are so bad with the written word. Part of the reason they're bad with the written word is they're bad with the spoken word. And that comes back to a lot of problems of our customs as regards to technology and so forth. So you get to so many root issues of, of what you as an intentional husband and father are going to be doing in the formation of your children, beginning with, hey, the main formation that will redound to their academic formation is I got to be thinking about a whole set of things in our lifestyle that are more important than any academic issue. To some extent, I don't care what classes they're taking nearly as much as I care about, you know, are you reading out loud as a family? Are you sitting around having certain kind of conversations? Are you together at the table? Are you sitting around the fire? Are you going for walks together? Are you engaging with the natural world? Are you learning basic physical human skills? If not, you know, the academic thing is kind of is, is, is kind of like a house of cards and it's not going to have the richness it should have. Yeah, I was before I came to ISI, I was finishing up my undergrad and I my last semester was teaching in a middle school. And it, it was just it became I was already having suspicions that the sort of college for all or even the. I guess what I'd call like the modern education system where everyone's sitting in a classroom for eight hours a day, five days a week. I was having starting to have my suspicions that this was actually a, a whole, some sort of horrible mistake in, in some way, and I couldn't really put my finger on it. But I was just starting to look around, and I'm not saying that the students were stupid. It was just they weren't engaged, and why weren't they engaged? It's because they weren't moved by what they were doing, um, and that doesn't mean that you know sometimes you, there are things that you need to know and you need to practice that you don't necessarily want to. So it's not an argument for letting the kids take over. But um, or just appealing to whatever their their interest is, because sometimes they have to have their interest expanded. And that's um, not always something that they want to do. But right, um, right. and maybe we could move into a, a more discussion of that. But it was just seemed to me that a lot of these students would be better served doing something else with their time as opposed to being stuck in school for 40 hours a week, um, learning things, probably a fair bit of it they don't need to know and other things that they do need to know that they weren't learning that they probably actually be much more interested in. A, 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 amen, Tom. And, and again, now is an age where we need to go back to first principles and ask and, and ask some deep, hard questions and be willing to rethink, um, especially paideia, formation of human persons. Right? Plato and Aristotle, they bent a lot of energy, spent a lot of their time what does it take to form a human person? Th this We have to renew this question. We have to bring the right principles to it. We need to have the right anthropology. We have to have a right understanding of human nature, what it is to be human, what the end or goal of human, the fulfillment of human nature is. We have to go back to sh a shared understanding of this. And this is going to fundamentally change how we approach education and what we do when we're there. And so just one thing that struck me as you're... Speaking there, Tom, is is again that you know I, I, a number of the listeners are going to be are going to be in college. I'm going to throw out a line right now. Just just it might sound random. It's not. Okay. It comes from Andrew Lytle. This is from the book "I'll Take My Stands." Andrew Lytle, you know, Tom is a Southern agrarian. Just so our readers know that you know it was a very interesting movement that was particularly in the 19 got started in the 1930s. 
any case, Andrew Lytle was one of the young ones then. He wrote an essay called 50 Years Later in the 1980s, and, and it's a fascinating look at the, at the 20th century. A great line in Andrew Lytle was, we are losing the ordinary functions of human living. Mm. We're losing the ordinary functions of human living, just the ordinary stuff of human life, the, 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 the kind of activities in which human life is most lived that always were first of all done in that primordial place of human life, the home. There, there being, by and large, it's not only technology, there's always principles behind it and practices, but the technology, often the media is the message. Right. There is a, it, it is very formative of how we're spending our time, right? So, so that certain kinds of activities and presence and relationship and connectedness, to use a Wendell Berry term, we, we are so dis- connected we, we, we need to get reconnected in ordinary human ways and if it didn't happen in your home the way you wanted to when you're growing up well you know wherever we are now's the time to start and so in college can't be just about the academics the academics are key hey i'm a professor that's what i do and I'm, I'm i'm all about it but we need we need to be taking a hard look at how we are living what are our lifestyle what are our moral choices how are we spending time with our friends what, what does that whole lifestyle look like that, again, where the custom is so bad, we need, we need to be reevaluating that particularly. Can I ask, uh, do you mind sharing how you personally got into and decided with your family that you know, we're going to live on a homestead and we're going to make these sorts of lifestyle decisions? Yeah, I'd love to, you know, Tom, because it's, it's, it, it, was, it was kind of based on principle. In other words, so quick story. Um, a big part of our homestead is we raise pigs. All right, so we, we from beginning to end, I breed them, I raise them, um, slaughter them, kill them, we slaughter them, I prepare them all with our own hands. It's it it's it's a shared work that binds us together. And I dis, and I decided to do it. I, I mean, here I get this is this is by the grace of God. I, I'm just. It was my prayer and sincere hope that it would be this way. And by the grace of God, it has been. That I, that, that I thought, look, you know, if looking back on things I had and some things I didn't have in my own childhood and reflecting on these things and reading the Greeks, the you know, work in the household, Wendell Berry, it's, 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 he says it's not just a brace or a prop for life. It's a fundamental form of life. Mm. And so I, 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 in thinking about making a homestead, my, 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 my intention was how can my wife and I craft something here that's going to give us something to do together and with our children that's going to be a kind of backbone. I like to say work is like the scaffold on which you build the rest of life. Uh, you know, it's it's properly understood. You know, Xenophon was right when, you know, Hesiod was right when they say man is made for work. That needs to be understood in view of leisure. Mm -hmm. if you, as Joseph Pieper says, if you don't have a right understanding of leisure, you won't have a right understanding of work. But properly understood as ultimately ordered to leisure, work is the kind of scaffold, the daily stuff. And, and not all work is created work, uh, equal. You know, E.F. Schumacher, certain kinds of work are better. And so I bring that to the, to, the, to the home and say, let's have the kind of work here that's going to help form all of us, not just the children, but the adults too, to be the kind of people we want to be. Uh, how did you go about setting up or deciding what that would be? Yeah, you know... Um, to, to some extent, it's, it's luck and you, and you just, you know, it's one of those, it's in certain ways, you know, Tom, it's like living in this age, there's certain things where you just have to kind of start over and you, sometimes you have to laugh. So I think of myself saying, uh, okay, wow, I'm going to, I'm going to slaughter a pig. Yep. Sure. There's always the proverbial YouTube video and, you know, and Hey, as Chesterton said, sometimes we have to use technology to solve the problems that technology started. Mm -hmm. So I certainly don't want to live on YouTube, but at the same time, if YouTube can help me develop certain skills, you know, I'm going to go to that. But I, the story I was going to, it's just, well, I knew there was an old timer who was the husband of someone who worked in the kitchen at the college. And I just went in there and I said, hey, Miss Vicky, 
You think you think Mr. Jimmy would be willing to come and show me how to how to slaughter a pig? Oh, and she, she, she said, "Would he ever?" <laughs> so to to find mentors. So, but part of it is just what mentors can you find? What I mean to me, you take a very hard nosed practical approach to this. I knew I was going to be able to find people to help me do the pig thing, so I did the pig thing. I, you know, I, 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 so my shtick there is you have to, you have to just be practical and discerning among the set of the traditional home arts, husbandry, real whiffery, house whiffery, which ones might it be realistic in our context to say, you know, I'm going to start with that one right there. I, I, I think it very much depends on the concrete circumstances of your life. Absolutely. Tell me more about life craft because you're, I think it's blog. Is it blogging about these sorts of things and sort of teach people getting the message out there? Or what are the sorts of things yeah, you do there? Yeah, yeah, it is. It is. And, and I mean, it, actually, but more of it, more than just, I mean, it is blogging. It started as just blogging. Now I actually have courses there. Uh, kind of the big ones, I have a man of the household course, a woman of the household course. So in other words, I'm, I'm, I'm bringing philosophy. And, and, and the way I put it, and, and it's the big response I get from people. We, we need philosophy more than ever. We, we, need, we need right thinking. We're not going to get back right practice at this point without right thinking. Mm-hmm. So, so Lifecraft is about helping people get right thinking, which both inspires them. Oh, okay. I can, for instance, have a homestead. I can think about my marriage and raising of children in, in this way that's rooted in ancient principles. This inspires them and it gives them confidence. Because again, Tom, there's so many people like you or maybe a little less formed, right? A little less connected, a little less tuned in, but they, but they, they know they want something different. And so they, to give them that kind of those principles in, in, in an accessible, understandable way, but so you can't dumb it down. You got to give it with richness. It gives them a sense of yes. This is doable. We can come together and we can do this. So that's basically what I'm trying to do through dip videos, courses, you know, podcasts. I'm starting just just bring that to more people so they can share it and get that conversation started. Awesome. Uh, I and we'll plug that in the show notes for people who are interested in um, maybe you afterwards when we're offline, you can send me a couple of the courses so I can give the proper links to them. I'm curious Correct. what your kids think of this sort of lifestyle that you've curated or not curated might not be the right word, but you know, built for them because, and how that maybe how they see that in relation to quote unquote, what everyone else is doing. Yeah. Once again, <laughs> you're prescient. Uh, and this, you're seeing into the future of having children who at times then when they're looking around, they look back at you and they say, what are you doing to me? And, 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 and the, and the thing is, Tom, it's it, uh, you know, living is always the art of the possible. And, and boy, have I seen people kind of go off the deep end of get super intentional and, and, and try to kind of <laughs> curate, you know, craft something here. And, 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 they, and they, as it were, try to do too much slash, slash something that isn't realistically living in the age in which we are. We're social animals. You always have to remember our basic <laughs> philosophy of human nature. You, you, we have to form our children to be different, but they also have to be connected and engaged in certain ways. They can only, they can't, they can only experience themselves as so much separated it, it, to the point where it will then become unnatural. So, by the grace of God, I, I the, you know, I, I, I think, I, I think our, my children have a sense of what my wife and I have been trying to do. We want, we want to give you the richness that sometimes is going to isolate you. And you know, Tom, it, it, it connects to the notion of friendship. Friendship requires shared principles. If we're going to have any kind of deeper friendship or any kind of deeper relationship, you know, a fortiori in marriage, there have to be these kind of shared principles. And so to some extent, it, it, it's, well, it, friendship's always going to be hard. And richer friendship, as Aristotle says, is rare because the kind of virtuous people that can do it are rare. And, and maybe we're especially going to feel that in an age where when you're raised by intentional parents, you're going to kind of look around and say, wow, wow 
whom can I go deeper with? Whom can I kind of share share my life with? And and that's hard. But as parents, are we as as teachers, are we then going to give less? Are we not going to form them to be that kind of person that's capable of having that kind of relationship? Just so, you know, we're going to not do that so that they don't suffer the suffering of of feeling isolated by sometimes not being able to find that person that is necessarily going to be a part of their life. Right. And I mean, I just know from personal experience, I had, and I think this is probably always true. There's the rebellious teenage years. Um, but especially in a culture of bad customs, going back to that from earlier, like I stopped going to church for years and I rebelled against religion because I was like, I don't get this. And in a secular age, well, we're not really a secular age, but in a sort of, you know, surface level secular age it's like it was very easy for me to be i think corrupted by the culture and then you know i've come back and it was the parents were right uh, you know shocker um they often are <laughs> but it's just that sort of thing and even when i think about it now is like not that i'm afraid to lose my future children to the culture but it's striking that sort of balance between um not necessarily embracing the culture but i guess because the Amish live totally off the grid from the rest of what most other people are doing. They have their own highly insulated or highly insular communities. And they're very fascinating, um, you know, for just, not just for sociological purposes, but there's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. The Amish in the United States is they still have the, their own very traditional rooted um, sense of community that they live together. But I just like, I don't want to say I don't have that, but a lot of people are, we're sw- we're just swimming in the world in which we swim, um, right? And so the the temptations, the challenges, um, are, are are much different. And, and, you know, and, and Tom, you know, the, the 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 Amish always are an interesting topic of discussion. Um, I, I won't say I haven't been accused of being Amish, <laughs> and clearly that was you know, uh, um, you know, supposed to be a devastating blow. I, I, I mean, the my view is, it, with all due respect to the Amish. Um, we need to do better, but including though learning from certain things, certain things they had the wisdom and the courage to preserve. And I think we all can learn from certain things that they had the wisdom and the courage to preserve. And but also we we simply are going to have to be more engaged in the world in which we are, and and that's very difficult. And as you were kind of hinting, I think a lot of families are very much suffering from, uh, you know, not having enough of the aspect of we simply must do something different. And we need and we need relationships and some kind of community support to help us do that. That that is a basic principle of human nature that is utterly verified by experience in history. And, and, and so you know, to have a sense of where are we going to get that community and what does it take to build community? Well, we're, that, that's, that's a question we're going to be asking and thinking and praying about the rest of our lives. That's right. I mean, I think it is not good for man to be alone. It doesn't just call for the need for man to have a wife and to have children, but also to live in this sort of community. There's this sort of interesting battle between the it takes a family and it takes a village crowd. Um, mm-hmm. That was, I think, percolating in like the 2008 and 2012 elections. Yep. Um, yep. But it's sort of an interesting thing. I wonder what your take is on how those things yeah. sort of interact. Because on the one hand, like it takes a family is a repudiation of the idea that I think we're going to have no families and we're just going to all live in sort of communes the way that, that maybe like Marx or, uh, or even Plato had in mind. Um, but at the same time, it seems like the family, though being a perfect society, um, in theory, in practice, we all actually live in larger communities than just our family insulated from everyone else. Right. right. Well, you know, it's funny you say that, Tom, because I, I, I do remember, um, you know, wh- when, you know, there was, there was that back and forth. And I remember specifically at the time thinking to the line, it takes a village. I, I, I don't think the answer just is, is to say, no, it doesn't because it does now. 
But that's village understood in the right way and not understood the way that those people were using it. And so that's, you know, that's why, you know, these public discussions are very difficult because they're the very terms in question here are, are, are not being are not being used well. And so it's 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 hard to to change the public discussion. But we, we at least need to have a sub community. We're able to have this discussion. We're able to use these terms well and recognize that obviously the answer is it takes a family and a village and those are deeply intertwined and having certain kinds of families produce certain kinds of villages. And of course, having a certain kind of village helps you have a certain kind of family. And again, this is this goes back partially to the liberal education thing. We, we need to have that. That's where because in so many ways we've lost families and villages in an understanding of how to do them, we need to have people learn how to think again. Sometimes it's just going back. You're right. There was some li- li- little bit of little bit of a problem there in Plato, but Aristotle, you know, in his fundamental principles of how he sets that up, he fundamentally gets that right. And there's so much that we need we need to learn about the the beautiful aspects there of the relationship between the household and the broader community. But but we can do it. And I, I mean, I we can start again in the household. That's always you know you can you start at that lowest level, the one that's directly in my power. Another way for those who are not married right now, start with your friends. To me, this is always always the recipe. Start with your friends. Start with your family. Now, it, it, Aristotle says in a great line in the Ethics, he says, "If political authority, especially, is not doing what it should be." The one thing that always remains in your power is you can go to your friends and you can go to in your own family and you can start to build again something very strong there. Clearly, that is is going to be central to what most of us are directly working on. I think this is a great place not to end, but to sort of segue towards our ending is ending on friendship. Um, I've, I mean, I've read Aristotle's Ethics. We've already sort of touched a little bit on the sort of the rarity of true friendship and the virtue required um, and the, the, the shared principles, you might even call it a shared worldview um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that requires a true and deep friendship. Um, I'm familiar with the idea of the bowling alone phenomenon where we're, we've become increasingly isolated. Technology, I think, has exacerbated that. Polarization has made us strangers to each other in many respects. What advice do you have for um people to help cultivate friendship, maybe just one or two very good lifelong yeah. friends. Yeah. It seems to me that a lot of, I, I certainly have very, very close friends, but it seems to me that actually a lot of people are lacking that today, which is to, to yeah. me surprising because how, how could you have anything else? But at the same time, I guess people just don't have it. Right. I, I, amen. Well, you've already, in, in how you put it, pointed to one my main first suggestion, and this, and, and this will take some intentionality, is to recognize that the most important thing we can do on the friendship level, most important after recognizing we need to become a certain kind of person. I should say that that first. If we don't become a certain kind of person with priorities straight, discipline, order in our souls, it's only to the extent that we do that that we will be able to have this kind of relationship. So we always start there. We start there with, with self-examination. The next step then is to be selective and to choose one or two or three where I go deeper. And, and, and I'll, I'm going to push this point, Tom. Sometimes people say to me, well, you know, this is being exclusive. We need to have a heart for everybody. We need to you know, be able to be friends with a broad swath of people. Everything that was just said, I agree with. Yes, you need to have a heart for everybody. Yes, you need to be able to interact with with a broad set of people and do so with with, with good manners. The great Saint Alred, medieval theologian, the way that he put it in Christian terms was, "You need to have charity for everybody, but you have deep friendship with very few." Right. It's it's two different kinds of things. And there's, and there's also another kind of, of, of a weaker, more shallow friendships, which there's a place for. Let's have those with the broader swath. But my principle is always this. It's precisely to the extent that we succeed 
in the in those few closest virtuous friendships it's in the it, it's in doing that that we will most become the person we should be and become more capable of interacting with everybody else well of taking up my place in society well precisely because of what i'm doing and becoming in those rich friendships that i'm really going deeper in that's a great insight and i don't think I have any questions to follow up on that. So I think we can end it there. Um, John, this has been wonderful. Um, I appreciate the time. I appreciate all of the, the fascinating insights. Really enjoyed this conversation. I think our listeners will as well. If people want to maybe take those classes, I know you mentioned, I'll make sure we get those in the show notes so people can sign up, register. Um, what, where else should people look for your work um, and other work that you recommend? Yeah, well, well, I mean, you know, at, at, at the website, I have, you know, references to all kinds of stuff. So there's, you know, there's, 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 there, 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 there's a lot there. So I mean, I guess right now, and I I'd kind of leave it at and I, I, I do love to refer to others that are kind of, you know, hoe in the row in the same field. Um, but um, I'd love to, love to share the resources that I have there. Excellent. Well, thanks again, John. Great, Tom. Good to be with you. Thank you for listening to Conservative Conversations with ISI. If you've enjoyed this episode, be sure to check out our website at isi.org slash resources to see all that we offer our members, including the Intercollegiate Review, Select Modern Age articles, debates, lectures, and of course, this podcast. Thanks again for listening. Don't forget to rate and review, and we will see you next time on Conservative Conversations with ISI.